So welcome to the session on feedback and equity. My name is Juan Povijo and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm calling in from Linwood, Washington. It's just north, north of Seattle. It's the traditional lands of the Snohomish tribe. I'm gonna honor their presence in this land. Um, and today I hope that we can engage in a conversation about how feedback and listening practices can support organizations equity efforts. So I'm gonna give you just some quick background um, I work for ORS Impact. It is an evaluation and strategy firm based in Seattle. Um, and in our work as thought partners to foundations, nonprofits, and government, we've seen and we've been part of the evolving conversations around equity in our sector. Um, now, on a somewhat separate but related field, uh, which is what you all are uh, joining today in the feedback summit, we've witnessed and documented the evolution of the feedback field in the past few years. And we saw an opportunity to more deeply explore the connection between those two concepts, equity and feedback. So how does feedback relate to equity? Conceptually, they seem to relate, but what we wanted to do was explore what that connection looks like in practice. So we've created a report um, if you haven't had a chance to read it, go for it. Uh, we've put our, all of our findings in it, and I'm going to go over some of those findings today. And I'm going to use those findings to guide our conversation. So quickly then, what I hope that we can do together today is review some of the frameworks and content from the report and discuss with each other how we see these concepts show up in our experience. The plan is to go over a first framework and then we'll break out into small groups then a second framework with a different set of small groups, and then a final framework with some uh, large group discussion and some lessons learned. Um, you'll of course have time to ask questions along the way. I'm gonna pause there and see if you have any questions before we get started. All right. You all have had coffee, so I'm gonna take silence as no questions. Um, so for some background, uh, first on where the data and the report come from. So we've partnered with six nonprofit uh, organizations in the United States who we knew that have uh, implemented high quality feedback loops. They've been part of the Listen for Good program. Um, and our goals in this partnership were, to, were twofold. One, um, to explore the extent to which client feedback contributes to nonprofits efforts to understand and address inequities that their clients face. And two, to understand how organizations leverage feedback and listening practices to share power with clients within their organizations, giving them more control over resources and decisions. So that's what we set out to do in this research. So one important aspect of force early on in this work was to define equity, right? What did we mean by equity and what were we looking for? We defined equity as shifting systems and conditions so those who have been excluded or oppressed benefit and become empowered agents of the change that they seek. And we were looking for equity focused work to manifest in two ways in organizations. One of them was the what for organizations, what organizations do to address inequities, the equitable outcomes to which they contribute through their services and the systems they work to address. And two, how organizations do their work, right? So one, on one hand, what organizations work on, and the other hand, how do organizations work? How do they relate to and share power with clients in ways that contribute to more equitable outcomes? All right, Juan, that's all great. What did we find, right? Let's turn to that. First, we found that feedback is in fact contributing to organizations' equity work. Specifically, we found two ways in which uh, this is happening. When an organization um, collects client feedback, there are specific insights, things that they learn about clients' experiences that can support equity efforts. In addition, we found that the act of listening itself also brings about change in organizations. Um, in other words, it's, it's not just about what organizations are learning from feedback, those insights, but just taking that intentional step of listening to clients is also contributing to equity efforts. And we're gonna see how. In addition to that, uh, we found two ways in which insights from feedback and the act of listening to clients contribute to organizational change. 
So we've set up this two by two uh, where the columns portray that as a result of either the insights of the act or the act of listening, um, organizations reported changes both in programs and services. So the actual programs and services that they um, implement, but also in their culture and policies. So we, we saw different, different types of changes uh, happening as a result of, of sort of feedback and listening practices. And I wanna give you some quick examples of what that looked like. So when we think about the insights coming from feedback, we saw uh, organizations create new programs, right? Based on those insights. We also saw that based on those insights, organizations were learning about harm that might have been happening to their clients and they were changing some practices and policies to, uh, to uh, sort of course correct. We also saw uh, in terms of the act of listening that uh, organizations were changing their programming to include advocacy, for example, and engaging clients in that advocacy. And finally, um, we saw that uh, there were some organizations were establishing um, client advisory boards or changing the way in which clients were relating to the organization no longer only as beneficiaries of services, but as partners in creating the work. So some quick examples here. Um, and I know that was a lot in setting up this framework, this two by two, and some folks join late. So I'm just gonna um, let some folks ask some questions. If you, if you have any before we uh, continue on to our first small group activity here. So do you have any questions about this setup of a two by two in terms of the changes that we've seen in organizations that are enacting high quality feedback and where that feedback is supporting organizations equity work. Any questions at this time? All right. Again, I'll take silence as no questions. Feel free to drop any questions uh, either on the chat or um, unmute at any time. Um, Eliza, I think we can uh, set up the groups. Let me just uh, give you the prompt here quickly and then we'll split it. Um, all right, so what I've done here in this next slide is I've provided some examples that we collected from our partner organizations, examples of the changes that they've seen in their organization. Um, and what we'd like to do is with your small groups, take a few minutes to discuss where on the two by two framework, you might place each example. So there's of course no right or wrong answer. Uh, the goal is just to practice identifying how feedback and listening can help organizations in their equity journey so that you may look out um, for these types of changes in your work or even uh, prompt these types of changes in your own work based on how you're setting up your feedback practices. Um, and when you're done, you can move on to sharing whether you've seen any examples in your own work outside of the examples that we've provided that might fit within this framework. Any questions on the prompt? All right, Eliza, we, I think we can go ahead and send folks to the smaller groups. All right, great. I'm going to open up the breakout rooms. And, and I'm going to throw in these examples into, um, into the chat for folks as well. OK, I'm going to let you drop those in the chat before so that hopefully it'll come through. So that everybody has them. OK, give me one second. Let me do that. I took a picture. <laughs> you took a picture. That's smart. Smarter than I was. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Dropping in the chat. Oh, I almost sent it only to Eliza. There we go. Of course, okay. they are not numbered in the chat. I apologize for that. No problem. I'm going to start opening the breakout rooms now. And Juan, would you like to be part of a breakout room or just stay in the main room? Wow. And tell I will stay in the main room to set up the next piece. And would you mind prompting me when you'd like the rooms to close and out? Sure. Thank you.
All right, I think we're all back. I'm curious to hear um, from anybody, so the floor is open, whether this exercise prompted any questions or any thoughts that you might want to share with the group. Now you all said you had coughing. This is not your first session, so if, if, uh, it would be great to have some engagement. Um, I didn't understand. Sorry, I did not understand the difference between insights and active listening. Was that you, Bianca? No, that was someone else. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, it was actually where, the in-person room. Oh, great. Questions. Yeah, the difference between insights from feedback and active listening. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, let me let me try to explain. So when we have an organization, um, it could be a nonprofit government, whatever, that's asking for client feedback, you know, we can ask a set of questions, right? We can ask the net promoter score question. We can ask what the organization was doing well, what they can improve upon. The responses to those questions um, are designed to give the organization some learnings, right? Some insights, either, uh, you know, if it's a closed uh, question, you get some average, right? So clients are uh, um, rating our services on a three out of a five. What does that mean for us, right? If it's a, an open-ended question, you'll learn something specific about clients' experiences with that um, organization. Those are what we're calling insights from client feedback, right? The things that you're actually learning from the, from the responses of those clients to your questions. Um, and so those insights, those things that you're learning can prompt changes in your programs and services, right? So if you get a really low um, score uh, just for the rating of your programs overall, you might change something in your programs, right? Or it might prompt some changes in your practices. There are some, some client feedback questions around, for example, how respected clients feel when they come to your organization. So you might change something in your, in your practices if you find out that folks are, the clients are not feeling respected. So that's what, what that will look like if you're learning from insights from feedback. The difference is in the act of listening is just that the act of, collecting client feedback. The organization has a, 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 an option to not collect client feedback, but the act of being open to listen to clients, <clears throat> that concept of uh, finding expertise in client voice is in itself creating changes. So if we think about um, valuing client feedback differently, right? So you have an organization who has never collected client feedback, and all of a sudden you have a program officer who starts saying, oh, I, want, I, I wonder what people are saying. That openness, that uh, op being open-minded to client feedback can also prompt changes in programs and services. For example, it can, it can, uh, they could probably start bringing in clients to help co-design the programs, right? Asking for client input at the, at the design of the programs, not just after the fact. Uh, it could also change practices in, in that uh, or policies in that now clients uh, begin to have to be involved in organizations' efforts all throughout the, the, the programming, not just at the end when they're giving feedback about something that has already been designed. Does that help uh, make that distinction between the act of listening itself and specific insights, learnings that you're getting from, from responses. Does that help? Oh, thank you. Thank you for your question. That was helpful for me as well. Um, I was just gonna mention that um, I was talking through the first one um, in, my, in my breakout group and um, we put it in the category of changes in programs and services from insights from feedback. And I think, uh, I, I work for a nonprofit and a lot of what we do is we try to train in place uh, underemployed or unemployed Americans. And our, usually our first inkling is to change something in our program uh, in response to feedback. And it's almost always our response to that. And I'm just wondering in the space of equity, 
um, like where, where could we get better at receiving that feedback and thinking uh, more internally about how we could respond uh, to certain concerns or needs that um, our constituents might have. And, um, and also how do, we, how do we move from let's change our program, you know, every quarter to pivot <laughs> um, to something that's uh, more foundational to uh, proactively address certain concerns. So, so that's something that uh, stuck out to me is that knee jerk reaction to change the program versus what institutional changes are we seeing in, in response to these uh, feedback. Right, Bianca, thank you so much for sharing that. That's exactly what, what we're trying to, to suss out in this two by two is it, it's easy to go straight to the program and services changes, right? And, and those are probably um, more often what we see if, when we look at it um, just at first glance. But then the question is, are there some sort of deeper, more structural changes that are happening? And that's where we start looking at um, sort of this culture, this policies, these practices. You know, so in your case, uh, if you're collecting client feedback and every single time you're changing your program based on that feedback, what would it look like to change your practice so that you're collecting client input when you're designing the program and not just collecting client feedback after they've experienced the program, right? So that would be not saying that you have to do that, just an example, like that would be a change in practice that might... Um, be more structural as you were saying uh, and, and not just have to uh, rely on changes based on the feedback after they've already experienced the program. So just an example of, of what we're trying to differentiate here in this two by two. All right, we're gonna have um, a couple of more chances to share uh, and we have a couple of more frameworks. So let me continue if that's okay. We'll have more, more time for questions as well, but those were great uh, insights. Thank you so much. All right. So the second framework that we um, <clears throat> uncovered through our work was that feedback can support organizations in different ways, particularly as it's related to equity, but this framework I think also holds if we think about feedback more broadly. So specifically, we found that feedback can act as a catalyst, a mirror, or a compass for organizations. What does that mean? So when, when feedback acts as a catalyst, it provides a spark to get things going, right? It can shed light on some tangible changes, some new opportunities to address equity. So in Bianca's example, I, you know, we can think about a lot of the feedback that you're getting as catalyzing some changes. Oh, we, we learned this. Let's do this, right? This, this sounds like an opportunity to improve our work. But there are other ways. Uh, feedback is also an accountability tool, right? Uh, if you state out, outright, this is our commitment, this is what you can expect from us, um, clients can use feedback as an accountability, uh, accountability tool that can help organizations identify gaps or ways in which current practices are or could be causing harm that is not visible to the organization, but is visible and tangible to clients. And it's a little, it's different from the catalyst, right? It, it's sort of saying, these are the trouble spots. This is what's happening. This is where you're not holding up your end of the bargain. And finally, it can become a compass. So feedback and listening can help organization, organizations explore and set direction for how to address inequities. Right, helping to set those priorities, helping understand what the client experiences and what those inequities that clients might be facing are within the organization and outside of the organization, right? Because at the end of the day, we're collecting client perception. And so we can learn a lot from that client perception about what's happening uh, that can set, help us uh, set that compass and show us the way forward. So uh, I wanna first again, invite any questions on this framework before we move on to the second set of small group discussions today. Not a question, but I just really, I really like this um, framework. It's useful and clear. Thank you. 
All right. So if no questions, we can go ahead and set up the next set of small groups. And for the in-person folks, just pair up. It could be the same people. It could be different people. We're going to use the same um, set of examples as last time. So they're already in the chat. Yay. But now we're going to ask you, um, how do you see these examples fitting into this framework? Where do you see feedback catalyzing? Where do you see feedback acting as a mirror? And where do you see feedback becoming a compass for organizations? And again, no right or wrong answer. The, the hope here is that um, you know, we can get better at identifying the different ways in which feedback is supporting our organization so that we can harness that power of feedback moving forward, all right? Again, if you're done, feel free to share examples of your own work where you might be seeing feedback acting in these different ways as it relates to the equity work in, um, in your own experience. So Eliza, I think we can um, open up the small groups unless there are any last minute questions. All right. Groups are ready. Let's go for it. I'll open up. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Explore its that direction. I'm Keisha. I'm Ezra. I'm Cersei. I'm Cersei. <laughs>
All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, curious again to hear if this discussion prompted any questions or thoughts that you might want to share with the full group. Or was there anything that you would adjust to the framework? Did you find any different categories that didn't necessarily, um, that weren't in the framework already? And some of them be all of them? <laughs> <laughs> we had, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I think it, it, it probably depends on how the organization is using the feedback. Um, in term and where the organization is at that point in time, right? So for an organization that's ready to make changes, it might be a, a catalyst, but for an organization that's sort of finding its way or, or um, you know, curious of where to go, that a, a piece of insight might help set the compass rather than um, become super tangible right away. So, so maybe I think our goal was to try to um, more explicitly put things in these buckets so that we can more explicitly harness the power of, of that specific piece of feedback as it relates to what the organization needs to do next. So could it also be on a continuum of time? Looking at it, that in, so like a catalyst is at the beginning and a compass is at the end you know, where it has, it's a, it's a start and an end process through those three. But, yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I don't know if it's a matter of time, but more so rather a, um, again, a matter of where, where the organization is. So if we think about feedback in a loop, right? Um, you might have something that's a catalyst at the, at the beginning of that loop. And then as you complete the, so, you know, you, you collect the, um, you make a change based on the catalyst, but then you you sort of start learning more about what that change means, and then you get something that is sort of setting a different direction. So if we go back to Bianca's um, example, might you have some piece of feedback, some insight from feedback that is a tangible change that you can make today in a program, and then you collect feedback again on that same program and you learn something else, but that's a little bit different, right? So maybe it's something that you're not addressing through that program, but it's a need that your clients have. There's some, some sort of inequity uh, that your client is facing that's not currently addressed for your program. That might help you set a compass and might set, help you set direction on something else that you can do to help address those inequities, right? So. Uh, maybe it's a time thing, but it's also, I think, more more related to where the organization is on the arc of, of sort of program design and implementation. So are you going to share with us the best answers? I did say there's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> so I said best answer. I didn't say right or wrong. I said best. Best answer. Uh, I, I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I still have one more framework to go through, so I don't know that I'll have time to do that. Um, any other questions or comments? When I was uh, talking with Jeff and we were going through these, um, it was helpful, the frameworks. Uh, I, I haven't used these before, but um, particularly when we were looking at number two and we were like, well, this seems like a compass framework. And it kind of sparked to me like, that's a different type of conversation or a different tool that we would use to get a feed, feedback rather than if we're looking at this from like a catalyst perspective, which my organization is usually looking at this from a catalyst perspective. And then also um, thinking about, well, we probably need to also have different people in the room uh, to uh, facilitate those conversations and to get better data across the org. Um, rather than just sticking this with our programs team. Um, there might be people who are better suited to have those conversations to get us more uh, meaningful feedback. Um, so that, that was helpful uh, in this exercise. Thank you, Bianca. So there's something that, that's in the paper that's not on this presentation for time purposes, but um, I guess I will cover it slightly in a second. But something to keep in mind is that 
how you structure, how you design your feedback practices matters in terms of whether you're going to get catalyst feedback or feedback that acts as a catalyst, feedback that acts as a mirror, or feedback that acts as a, as a compass. Um, so, you know, if, if you're asking for feedback at the end of a program, uh, you might get sort of all three, but the lens is usually, as you said, Bianca, the lens is usually as the lens of a catalyst, right? Like what's the thing that we can do to respond to that feedback, right? If you're thinking about it as a, as a compass though, and using number two as an example, right? So this organization was exploring how to better serve hard of hearing clients who are currently not taking full advantage of programs. Of course, they learned that that, uh, that was an issue uh, from feedback, but the exploration, like there's no immediate change that they made. Like it wasn't like, let me just go ahead and change this and this will solve everything. They were taking the time to explore what that could look like. And then, and they were engaging clients in that process to explore what that answer could be, right? So then you get something that's a little bit of, of, of both to, to whoever answer that, ask that question, we have something that's catalyzing an idea, but there's no necessarily an immediate response that you can that you can enact. There, there's a little bit of work. There's a little bit of, of, of sort of, yes, we need to pay attention, right? So that's why we put it in a compass. We need to pay attention to this. Uh, this is a priority now, but let's explore what that looks like because we're not really sure, right? And let, let's let's involve clients in that conversation because they'll know better than we than we will. All right, so let me move on to this last framework. We learned a lot from this uh, process. Um, all the examples that we shared today pointed to shifting power dynamics within organizations. So even though nonprofits deliver services that are in theory beneficial to their clients, they still hold power over clients. They control the design of and implementation of programs and therefore, they make decisions that influence and impact clients' lives, right? So the clients, so those people that are most impacted by nonprofit services, who have the most to gain or to lose from those services, often have the least say about what they are experiencing through those services. So we found, uh, what we found was that through feedback and, and listening, organizations are shifting from having power over clients to building power with clients. So by giving clients a voice, listening and responding to that feedback, and of course, closing the loop with those clients, uh, clients have increasing power to shape the services that they use and how they experience those services. The shift is also part of uh, what we looked at when we considered what equity could be, what, how feedback could contribute to equity, right? So we mentioned that equity could be what organizations are working towards. So, you know, making programs more accessible, all of that, but it could also be how the organization is working, right? Um, and so in this case, we found that feedback is contributing to equity by shifting whose voices are at the table and who has decision-making power within organizations, all right? We don't have time to go back into small groups, but we're going to do just do a few minutes of large group discussion. Um, and I'm curious to hear how you have seen feedback and listening support organizations shift from having power over clients to building power with clients. So I just given one example of um, this organization now engaging clients to help them understand hard of hearing clients. Um, to help them understand how their services can be better designed to uh, make them more accessible to, to that population, right? And, and in shifting that power and giving clients that decision-making power on what those services will look like in the future, there's a fundamental shift of who is designing and for whom. So in your experiences, where have you seen those examples? Can you share some with the group? Right now in public media and independent news and media in general, there is a, a, it's not even an organizational level, it's a whole higher level of shift 
because, and then for example, with television, television used to be the, the, the um, broadcasters determining what you're going to watch when you're going to watch with very, I mean, ratings, but now that's completely out the window because everything's downloadable and streaming. So we get to choose when we watch and what we want to watch and how we want to watch it. And with uh, the Jacksonville public media that I work for WJCT, we've created an independent news. We're creating an independent local, hyper-local digital first. We're not the first Texas Tribune, the Vermont Digger, those are popular ones in the country that is shifting that so that, you know, we're not deciding what the community hears and when they hear it, we're engaging the community to help us make that decision collectively. I mean, we do have some expertise in it, so breaking news and things like that, but then we're trying to create something that engages the community to help us decide what's important, what they wanna hear, what they think others should hear. Thank you for that. What's your name, I'm sorry? Sorry, Cersei Lenoble. Cersei, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, that's a fundamental power shift, right? Like who is deciding what information is important for the community, right? So you're, you're, you're bringing your expertise to the table in terms of uh, you know, how you identify those things, how you uh, broadcast them, how you share them with the public, but you're building power with the community by giving them basically decision-making power in terms of what is important for them to understand and learn about. That's a great example, thank you. Any, any other examples? We maybe have time for one or two more. Um, this is Callan here with the Nonprofit Center of Northeast Florida. I was sharing in one of my small groups that when, you know, we started offering um, like trainings around equity the past couple of years, uh, you know, one of the things that we came to obviously as a conclusion internally is that we're not experts in this space. So how can we learn more and build our internal capacity at the same time as helping our external, our constituents, our members build their capacity. So one thing we instituted was accountability circles where it was more about bringing our nonprofit members together to have these discussions around what does it mean to like build a, a DEI strategy or something at our organizations and it, exactly breaking it into like the external as far as like programs and services, but also internally with like our org culture and like what our policies are saying. So in that way, we were trying to share with our members that we're not experts and we need to learn and work on this as much as they do. But by bringing the group together for our accountability circles, it was us being accountable to one another and not, you know, trying to say that we have this power that we're, you know, better than any of our nonprofit members, just because we're the nonprofit center and we're supposed to maybe have some kind of leadership or expertise here, but to say that we wanted to build that power basically together and to learn from one another about what's working, what do we need to change? How, how can we, you know, feedback loop more to, to get to this place of, of greater equity in our work? Thank you for sharing that. And that's interesting because in your case, your clients are not people, right? Your clients, your immediate clients are, are so the nonprofits that are uh, members of your, um, of your network. Um, but even there, you can share power, right? Right. Um, so the, the fundamental question here is who's at the table and who's making decisions, regardless of who the players are, right? Right. Um, Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing those two examples. Let me move on to um, just a final sort of set of um, insights here. So we, we did develop a few takeaways that I wanna share with you before we adjourn for today. Um, the first one is that high quality feedback, um, uh, sorry, before I get to the, to the diagram, uh, organizations have to be intentional about this, right? It's not gonna happen by accident. And in order for this, for, for feedback and equity to, to uh, contribute to each other, um, you need a, a sort of a set of things to be in place. So first, high quality feedback practices have to be in place. If you're not collecting feedback, your feedback is not going to contribute to equity, period. But if you're not also thinking about equity intentionally, you're not gonna make that connection to feedback. So those two things have to be in place at organizations. 
in order for that connection to happen. But in addition, there's sort of a set of um, supporting uh, practices and structures that play into it. So you, you have to have some sort of client-centered culture. You have to care about your clients and you have to, um, or at least in, in our experience and, and what we learned, there has to be some sort of focus on clients as the reason for the work, right? Um, you have to have a commitment to learning. You have to be curious. You want to have, you have to want to learn about how to improve your work continuously. And finally, there are a set of external supports, right? So funding, uh, knowledge, a supportive structure, a learning community that is helping you improve like the feedback summit, that's helping you sort of improve and, and continues, continuously ask yourself how to do this work better. A few other reflections. Uh, this is something that we mentioned earlier, uh, so I think Bianca to your question, different types of listening practices will inform equity work differently. So design matters, right? So going back to the catalyst mirror compass, different design, different feedback mechanisms and the, the time point where you're collecting client feedback um, are better suited to generate different types of, of impact. So just thinking about the design, when you're collecting that information, how you're collecting that information, the types of questions that you're asking are going to matter in terms of whether you get catalyst, mirror, or compass, or a combination. Um, second, we saw feedback uh, um, lead to different things. So high quality feedback ended up being a first step in broader efforts to share power. Uh, we saw feedback leading to client advisory boards, to different hiring practices where now clients were being hired as staff. So it was only a first step in a, in a much broader process to shift power to those who have the most to gain or lose from those services. We also found room to improve across the board. These organizations, um, we thought and hypothesized that they were far along the spectrum. They were already implementing high quality feedback loops. They were on the high end of, in terms of thinking about equity and their equity journey as organizations. Um, but even they also were able to identify very concrete next steps. What, what were they missing? What, how could they improve? Um, so this is an ongoing journey, right? Um, most of the evidence uh, that we found related to changes in interim outcomes, and I'll tell you what that means. Um, the changes we uncovered related mostly to increasing diversity to, uh, and inclusion, for example, by making services more accessible, right? So the, the, the uh, example of the hard of hearing clients. Um, they, that example is sort of the, the organization was trying to make the uh, services more inclusive, more accessible to that subpopulation and more responsive to the needs, right? We also saw a lot of examples about shifting power that we've already discussed. So these types of changes can absolutely lead to addressing inequities in society. But we didn't necessarily see examples of systemic barriers being addressed, not yet. We did see promising first steps. We did see advocacy uh, changes in, in what organizations were advocating for. Uh, we saw organizations advocating for sort of changes in laws in Florida, uh, for instance. So PACE is now advocating for uh, changes in, in laws uh, that affect their, their girls. Uh, so we did see some promising changes, but we're not yet seeing sort of that systemic barrier to equity being addressed. It's promising though, and it's sort of part of that, of that journey. And finally, um, as we've mentioned before, there are supportive practices and structures that play into this work, including external supports. And, and we are mindful and, and we heard repeatedly that nonprofits need partners and they need funding um, to change how they work in pursuit of equity. So with that, we have just a few minutes to close. I'm curious to hear from the group. Uh, was anything surprising to you? Was anything, uh, you know, were, were there aha moments? Or do you have any questions? Is there something that you were left wondering and wanting to know more about? Your last point, number five, was where I've been 
kind of most of these last three days is, you know, we, and I think the organizations in, at this conference are all at different points of, of feedback, of developing it or implementing it or, or understanding it. And I, I think your last point about the equity work requires supportive structures, including funding is something that's um, important, especially for smaller organizations. Um, you know, I collect tons of data and I know basic things of what to do with it, but I, I don't know and I don't know the support out there to help us really understand the different things that this can mean and, and then how those impacts can be spread throughout the organization to, to really change the culture of how, you know, it's a, it's an organizational culture shift and, and our, we had a new CEO about four years ago and he's trying to make us more reliant upon data and KPIs from his business perspective, because the misnomer that nonprofits are different than businesses, you know, is, is finally starting to be take dismantled. They need to be run by a business that relies on feedback and input and, and those kind of business structures. And so that's my thing. And the most important thing is that last part of, I think that's where a lot of the support and funding is needed to help organizations understand what to do with all this feedback. Thank you for sharing that. Any other comments in the last minute that we have together? Any questions? This is Eliza from the, the in-person room. I just appreciated kind of speaking with those frameworks. Um, I'm definitely love kind of sitting with them and thinking about them. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining today. I hope that this has been helpful. Um, the paper out is out there with all of these frameworks. So um, I, I also think it's on the Feedback Labs page. Um, so yeah, feel free to go for it and reach out um, if you have any questions. We'll be around. Thank you so much. It was wonderful spending some time with you today. <laughs>